is the postgraduate panel number two, and we have three short presentations. Uh, Will Horner is the first one to talk about uh, why series are won, Laclau, Populism and Hegemony. Uh, he's coming from London, University College, London. Um, welcome. And then we're going to have uh, Aristoteles Arrigodopoulos uh, from the University of Siegen in Germany. Um, telling us about political discourse and populism in Greece and comparison between Syriza and Anel. Marius Pesius uh, is from Aristotle University from here, and he's talking about 2014 European elections and populism is the Greek Communist Party, a populist party. And I am uh, Emilia Palonen from the University of Helsinki, uh, and I'm going to be again working as a lecturer there from September, and I'm really happy to be here with uh, these promising um, young researchers who will start presenting their papers now. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> How do I sound? Good? Okay, so thank you, Amelia. Uh, thank you, of course. Uh, to the Populismus uh, team for having me, giving me this opportunity. Um, just a few words before I start. Um, I'm essentially summarizing my 12,000 word master's dissertation in 10 minutes. So we'll see how uh, long it takes me. Um, a lot of uh, what Yorgos covered yesterday is very similar, so hopefully I can pass over certain uh, areas a little faster because we all know roughly what we're talking about. Um, but if I do end up repeating uh, things we've covered a lot, just bear with me. Um, consider it to be a sort of uh, early morning refresher and uh, towards the end of my presentation hopefully I can draw some conclusions which haven't yet been made. Okay. So using Leclau's theory as a basis, Stavrakakis and Katzenbeckis have argued that Syriza displays strong populist tendencies as a result of the party's discursive references to the people and to an antagonistic frontier dividing, dividing Greek society. So their approach is based on the minimal criteria of the populismus research project, something we're quite familiar with, I think, by now. But I'll just summarize it as um, the test for two key criteria in a populist discourse, references to the people and to an antagonistic uh, frontier. And so by studying the speeches of Alexis Tsipras, Syriza's leader, and the headlines of the party's newspaper, they identify uh, both these key criteria in Syriza's discourse, thus, uh, thus uh, classifying it as a populist uh, movement, a populist party. Um, however, as Leclau argues, populism is dependent on the existence of a hegemonic relation which ties together the chain of equivalences and an empty signifier. Now, the chain of equivalences represents a horizontal structure with each demand operating parallel and not above another demand. The empty signifier, on the other hand, is a vertical structure which elevates one particular above the other's in order to signify the totality of the chain. Now, as Leclerc makes clear, populism is dependent on both of these axes, which are mutually dependent. And I quote Leclerc here in uh, a very recent interview he conducted, I think it was 2014, I think it's a very interesting interview, and this quote in particular I think is very relevant. I quote now, without the horizontal axis, there would be no vertical axis either. It is because the equivalential horizontal axis is already there that the need emerges of signifying it as a totality. The answer to that need is the production of empty signifiers. That is the constitution of the vertical axis. And this bit, I think, is particularly crucial. He goes on. But this second axis is strictly functional to the presence of the first. Without equivalential chains needing some global representation, there would be no social log logic giving the rationale for the emergence of a leadership, end quote. 
So therefore, we should consider Syriza itself to be just one part of a populist movement. In other words, Syriza constitutes the vertical axis only. What then, I ask, were the conditions that, as Leclerc says, gave the rationale for the emergence of Syriza's leadership? What constitutes the horizontal axis to which Syriza is merely a functional presence? The answer to these questions, I argue, can be found in the broad and diverse social movements which emerged in Greece in May 2011. I'm, of course, referring to the Agnactis Many. Yorgos covered this yesterday quite well, so I'll try and pass over it quite quickly, except for highlighting a few key criteria. So I, I would uh, note in particular the horizontal aspect of the Agonactis Many. Many commentators co uh, noted this. <clears throat> the protests were broad and diverse, representing a heterogeneous mix of the population. And what's more, I would note that Syriza's presence at, this, at these occupations as an informal participant rather than an organizer or a coordinator was noted by both journalists and academics. So I would argue uh, that these protests, the diverse and heterogeneous nature of them, gathering together in occupation was the moment of the emergence of a chain of equivalences. It marked a situation of particular demands, which out of a mutual opposition to a government they all conceived as their enemy, they began to develop a feeling of solidarity between themselves and therefore a logic of equivalence. Now jumping forward uh, five months to October 2011, in events which very much uh, mirror current developments, uh, the then Prime Minister, George Papandreou from PASOK, announced the government would hold a referendum on the austerity measures. Uh, now, the response in this case to, the, to this, the, the Troika's response was extremely hostile. And after pressure from leading European politicians, Papandreou uh, and the Troika, Papandreou swiftly backtracked, uh, canceled the referendum, and within a week had resigned and uh, a technocrat technocratic government was put in his place. Now, this event, I argue, was extremely significant in the development of a populist movement. As Lacau says, populism is dependent on the plebs viewing themselves as the populace, the part as the whole. And the exclusion of the regime from their conception of social totality is, uh, is crucial for this. Now, Syriza's discourse, uh, as I think Yanis and Yorgos have shown in their work, was one which associated the ruling parties of, of Greece uh, the major parties, associated these parties with the Troika discursively by referring to an internal Troika and an external Troika. Now, the events of this failed referendum, I think, blurred the distinction between internal Troika and external Troika, leaving just the Greek people on one hand and the Troika, the ex external to Greek society. For many, this was a clear indication, the, the, the council referendum, it was a clear indication of an internal antagonistic frontier dividing the Greek people from the regime of international political and financial elites. Now moving forward again to a new, uh, a next point, another point, uh, I would argue that the May and June 2012 parliamentary elections marked the consolidation of this popular movement, the chain of equivalences formed in the Agonactis many protests. Under, under Syriza's banner, essentially the hegemon, hegemonization, hegemonization of the movement by uh, Syriza. I won't go over the precise figures of the elections. You guys covered them yesterday. We're all roughly aware of, of what happened, but suffice to say that even between the May election and the June election in the space of just a month, Syriza's vote jumped considerably and the vote of other left parties, PASOK and the KKE, again, continued uh, uh, its decline. And I argue that these elections, uh, this exodus of voters from the traditional left towards Syriza represents this hegemonization of the movement. It represents Syriza adopting the position of uh, empty signifier. What is necessary for the formation of a popular movement is the unification of the equivalential chain whose equivalence up to that point, I quote Leclerc now, whose equivalence up to that point 
had not gone beyond a feeling of vague solidarity into a stable system of signification. So yeah, I, I argued that Syriza played, the, played this role, unified the chain, but as it adopted the role of empty signifier. Syriza, therefore, I argue, constitutes the vertical axis of a popular movement, a position which is entirely dependent on the prior emergence of a horizontal axis, the chain of equivalences. In other words, the agonact is many. Recognizing Syriza's debt to the agonact is many, first of all, validates Leclerc's assertion that it is the horizontal axis which takes primacy over the vertical, but also leads us to conclude that Syriza is not merely populist because of a populist rhetoric, but by virtue of its position as the empty signifier of the equivalential chain. It also suggests the need, I believe, to augment the two criteria of the minimal criteria the references to the people and to the antagonistic frontier with a, with a third, with a third criteria. Such an addition could be formulated along the following lines. To what extent does movement X exhibit a vertical and horizontal structure in a relationship of mutual dependence? Now, as it stands, I believe the minimal criteria has no method of testing for this structure. It cannot differentiate between movements which are purely horizontal, movements which are purely vertical, and movements which uh, combine the two. So for example, we could imagine a political party, therefore a vertical structure, which uses rhetoric heavy with references to the people, to an antagonistic frontier, but which does not represent a horizontal movement of equivalential demands. It is not the tip of the iceberg, to paraphrase Leclau. It would succeed in satisfying the two minimal criteria, leading us to conclude, therefore, that it's populist, yet it wouldn't constitute a full populist movement in the sense that Leclau, as Leclau defines it, as a hegemonic movement. I think there's a contemporary example of this, of this kind of party, and that's France's Front de Gauche, a party which openly acknowledges its populist discourse, yet doesn't lead a broad social movement as no large popular mobilizations have taken place in France on the same scale that they have in Greece and Spain. I ask, can we say convincingly that the Front de Gauche and Syriza both constitute populist movements to the same degree? Should we not be able to specify the novel aspect of Syriza that is the hegemonic relation in regards to the front de gauche, which doesn't have that unique relation. Should we not develop tools to differentiate, differentiate between them? Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll briefly uh, skip to the next point. I think, so I've, that's, I've suggested a example of a purely vertical movement. You can also imagine a purely horizontal movement, which also would satisfy the two minimal criteria, yet wouldn't constitute both a vertical and horizontal movement as Leclerc stresses is necessary to, to be a populist movement. And a, a brief example of that I would suggest is Occupy Wall Street. The addition of a third criteria which tested for the presence of the hegemonic relation, the vertical horizontal structure, would enable analysts to be more specific, specific in studies of populist movements. What's more, what's more such an addition takes to its logical conclusion the notion that discourse is not limited to linguistic forms, but, but encompasses all meaningful relations that constitute identity, an idea which uh, is central to the Essex School of Discourse Analysis. The logical conclusion of this is that the organizational structure of a movement is as much a discursive operation as its rhetoric. And I quote uh, Yanis here, who says, Organizational aspects of populist movements should not be studied independently of populist discourse, but as dimensions of the discourse through which these movements and political identities are constituted. And so finally, I just stress that expanding the minimal criteria beyond an analysis of a purely linguistic discourses to include an, an analysis of organizational structures is, is the full realization of this idea. It's, it takes this idea to its, uh, 
to its conclusion, I argue. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Will. Will was actually warning me that it could be 13 minutes, and it was exactly 13 minutes. Now we have Ari's paper. Yes, hello, and uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to Yanni and the whole Populismus project. It's the first time to read in Greece. Um, I will, um, in what follows, I want briefly present my recently begun PhD project, in which I'm going to compare the populist discourse of two Greek parties, the left-wing Syriza, coalition of the radical left, and the right-wing independent Greeks, from now on, Anel. Um, that are frequently described as populist parties from both academia and journalism. The crisis and the austerity program of the Troika have been dominating the discourse in Greece since 2010 extensively. The election results within this period in 2012 already changed the political spectrum radically. The entry of seven parties into parliament made coalition formation a necessary condition to govern. Yet the elections of January 25 in which series are won by a landslide, eventually marked a fundamental change in the political system of Greece. Syriza's victory put an end to the bipolar system of PASOK and New Democracy and forced them simultaneously into a position for the first time. Syriza immediately formed a ruling coalition with Anel. This situation is politically charged because of two reasons. First, both parties have never been in office before Second, both represent sharply different ideologies, but nonetheless became partners. In this context, I will ex examine the political and populist discourse of Syriza and Anel in their period of opposition and after their government takeover. Nevertheless, we have to consider Syriza as the driving force behind this coalition and Anel as the little hegemonic partner. Why did the populist discourse of Syriza succeed and eventually result in the election victory? And how could Syriza form a coalition government with Anel in spite of their ideologic differences? So here uh, the um, uh, findings of Yanni and Katsambekis, Viorgos, are very uh, crucial for me. Um, what kind of populist uh, discourse did Syriza and Anel use? And which similarities and differences can be located between both discourses? What kind of transition in the populist discourse can and will be found since they have formed a coalition government? And how will this process modify the chain of equivalences? So these are my research questions for the next two years. Uh, and so I'm recently um, at the beginning of my PhD project. In regard to the first uh, questions, it is relevant to analyze Syriza stance in the pre-electoral period in order to understand their rise. The next questions refer to a direct comparison of both parties concerning the populist features and especially their common and their particular demands. The last questions address the tr transition of the discourse. They lay specific emphasis on the period of negotiations with the institutions or creditors and the upcoming implementation period of reform. In other words, what effect will an agreement or a rupture with the creditors have for the populist discourse of both parties. Next, I'm going to introduce the theoretical foundations of my PhD project. My basis to start from is Laclau's and Mouffe's concept of discourse and hegemony and Laclau's theory of populism. In this context, Martin Nonhoff, a German professor for political theory and discourse analysis, operationalized Laclau's and Mouffe's theory of hegemony, which is crucial for my empirical research. This concept he originally, um, he originally constructed within his PhD project uh, on a social market economy um, as a German hegemony project in 2005. Nonhoff, in particular, developed a set of methodological guidelines for discourse analysis of hegemony. I will come back to that later. 
Following none of theory, I'm currently about to conceptualize a semi-structured interview that I would like to conduct with political actors, ministers and MPs from both parties at the end of this year. These interviews aim at the localization of the participants' hegemonic subjectivity and at the qualification of discursive similarities and differences between both parties. To consolidate these findings, I will refer back to the findings of the Populismus project and additionally conduct discourse analysis of documents of both parties, like party programs, election campaigns, and parliamentary debates. Taken as a whole, these four pillars that you can see on my slide are supposed to support each other and form a suffi sufficient starting point to understand Syriza and Anel's populist discourse and the anti-austerity project. So next I will briefly outline Martin Nonov's concept of functionalist discourse analysis, um, but uh, due to the limited time, I won't be able to enlarge up on Nonov's ideas. The methodological and analytic tool, I quote Nonov, aims at understanding how specific functions or mechanisms of discourse work, in this case, hegemony. His emphasis here lays on the conceptualization of what he calls hegemonic strategy. I quote Nonov again, the reason for this is that looking at strategy allows us to turn to the level of discursive elements and to the modes of arranging them. And these modes of arranging, as well as the resulting, never entirely fixed arrangements can be traced in discourse. And more precisely, across time and discursive space. End of quote. This concept, in turn, allows me to scrutinize rather complex processes of arranging sufficiently because it breaks down a discursive strategy into singular, what none of called, um, uh, called, called strategies. This is crucial for the analysis of hegemonic demands, the formation in a chain of equivalence, and moreover, the transitions. So a first hypothesis reads as follows. The left-right government of Syriza and Anel could be understood as an anti-austerity project or anti-crisis project, since for both parties, the Troika and the German hegemony in the European Union operate as the constitutive outside of their discourse. In regard to this proposition, I drew a simplified illustration in order to visualize the chain of demands that hold Syriza and Anel together. With La Clauen move, one could speak of the formation of a chain of equivalence. As you, see, as you can see, I chose the most striking signifiers as nodal points of the populist discourse for this mapping. Even so, Syriza and Anel define these terms contrastively because of the different ideologies, they are nonetheless able to form a chain of equivalence based on the common constitutive outside or the common enemy. In case of Syriza and Anel, this constitutive outside is represented by the institutions of the Troika and the German hegemony in the European Union from without, and PASOK and New Democracy, and also the Greek oligarchy, oligarchy as the same constitutive outside from within Greece. Just because of these alien forces, they were able to construct a collective identity, which, as I aforementioned, can be titled as hegemonic anti-austerity or anti-crisis project. We have to consider that it's not only Syriza and Anel that came to terms, but also a strong common will of individuals that became subjects to the very same discursive formation here in Greece. The crucial point of this specific constellation, however, is that the relation between the coalition and the constitutive outside is determined, determined by an asymmetric balance of power. Being a relation of creditors and debtors in which the neoliberal hegemony obtains a discursive dominance or an interpretational sovereignty against the hegemonic project of Syriza. Considering these conditions and the ongoing aggravation of negotiations, it is of, it is of utmost importance to analyze, to analyze the modification of the discourse arrangements, more precisely the changing relations of articulations, nodal points, and empty signifiers in the chain of equivalences. All these processes have to be taken into account because they will be dis decisive for the success or failure of Syriza's and Anel anti-austerity project. So coming to the end. I 
I would like to mention some difference between a series and an L. I detect four certain policy fields. These are the um, big issues of immigration, uh, integ integration of Greek citizenship, the issue of refugees, the relation of state and the Greek Orthodox Church, and the issue of military or warfare. Um, the late, um, last Thursday, Anel uh, wrote against Syriza, Syriza's bill concerning the Greek citizenship to immigrants' children. Nevertheless, the bill did pass because of voters from Pasok and Potami and of one Anel MP who disavised from the line of his party. This didn't surprise us, however, because Anel had announced that they, would, that they wouldn't agree to any of Syriza's bills before Syriza and Anel came to terms in end of January. The cause is that Anel has a different concept of nation, the people, and national identity. In this context, Anel uh, would present it referring to Mude and Cristobal Rovira Caldwasser, uh, inclusionary kind of populism, and Syriza, an inclusionary one. Before I close, I want to mention another point which is crucial to keep in mind and what we have briefly addressed in the last two days is what happens if the populist comes to power, so namely the problem of shifting discourses more precisely to integrate two different discursive frameworks. On the one hand, to continue the populist pre-electoral framework, and on the other hand, to a new governmental normal language without losing one's integrity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Aristoteles, and uh, then Marius. Well, my uh, speech about the European oh, no. uh, 2014 European elections and populism. Is the Communist Party a populist party? After 2012 crucial parliamentary elections, the term populism has been wisely, wisely used both in... Ah, much more louder. It's okay? All right. Uh, after 2012 crucial parliamentary elections... The okay. Ah, it's okay. All right. After 2012 crucial parliamentary elections, the term populism has been widely used both in Greek parties, discourse, and by academics. Three years after the break of economic crisis and the implementation of austerity measures, the budget cuts in welfare, and the ensuing poverty and high unemployment had triggered major developments in the Greek political system. The traditional parties collapsed, while the coalition of radical left Syriza managed to surge in the polls and become the main opposition party. Adonis Samaras' coalition government, the mainstream media, very often accused Syriza and Greek left in general as populist. Moreover, since 2014, many scholars have been published analysis on the populism of Syriza, but none, but none has so far the second pillar of the left in Greece, the Communist Party. Well, about the thesis and methodology. The aim of this paper is to show that despite the existence of some populist characteristics in communist party discourse, the latter should be convinced as a non-populist party. To empirically support this that thesis, we have focused on the party's pre-election speech in Athens and Thessaloniki, TV commercials, articles from parties of official newspaper Rizos Pastis, and official magazine Comep. Our theoretical framework is based on Ernesto Laclau's approach to populism. Populist preconditions. During the economic crisis, three different governments emerged, all of them accepting the so-called memoranda that were dictated by European Union, MIF, and European Central Bank. These governments were the government of Georgios Papandreou, the coalition government of Lucas Papadimos, and the government of Adonis Samaras. All of them attempted to secure a consensus on the imposed memoranda, incorporating popular interpolation in their discourses in a bid to neutralize opposed at the austerity or at the memoranda discourses. The economic crisis rendered 2012 uh, European election crucial for the survival of the dominant power bloc. The latter have passed a serious systematic crisis, giving chances for the dominant, dominated classes 
to precipitate crisis in the dominant ideological discourse to achieve their ultimate goal, to become hegemonic. The Communist Party discourse is one of them. The Communist Party discourse integrates the people and at the same time puts forth an antagonistic perception of the, of the Greek society as divided between the people and the European Union and supporters. The concept of the people in Communist Party discourse. <laughs> the most prominent characteristic of Laclau's uh, notion of populism is the central position of the notion of the people. Indeed, in the 2014 European election, Communist Party discourse doesn't focus on the terms like working class or industrial workers, but on the people in general. Uh, this notion of the people, according to the party declaration for the 2014 European election, includes manual and white collar workers, uh, breadwinners, self employed, poor farmers, and the, the youth and the pensioners, while in pre election speeches, it includes also students and women. Even though the Communist Party occasionally clarifies in detail the context of the subject of the people, a more value conception of this category has prevailed in 2014. In my view, the Communist Party has relaxed its ideologi ideological discipline, and at the same time, it uh, purports to expand its influence on specific social strata, for instance, on freelances. We could highlight this point here by counting the frequency of the use of the signifier Laos, the people, in comparison with Ergatiki Taxi, working class. For example, uh, in pre-election speech in May, uh, in Athens in May, the word Laos is used 22 times, while the phrase Ergatiki Taxi just three. Moreover, the, pre the basic pre-election slogan Ψηφίζουμε δυναμώνουμε το κουκουέ παντού γιατί ελπίδα είναι δύναμη του λαού. We vote and support Communist Party because the hope and the people's power. It's referred definitely to the people and not to working class. Now, what about the people power block contradiction? The definition of enemy Communist Party discourse is broader in comparison with one, uh, with the one of the people. For instance, series of discourse divides society into two main blocks the people and the memorandum establishment. In our case, the Communist Party discourse is also articulated on the base of a dichotomous and equivalential schema with an antagonistic pattern, but it differs because the memorandum establishment is replaced by capitalist system. For the Communist Party, the enemy can be defined as capitalism in general. For instance, the party's gen uh, secretary general, Dimitris Kuchubas, accused capitalism for the impact of economic crisis. It is cruel to be unemployed, to be unable to feed your children, to not have access to welfare, to education. That cruelty has a name, it's called capitalism. The enemy in the party's discourse can be categorized in two levels. On the first level, it includes all the political in Greece, because on the one hand they support new, new liberalism and certain new, new liberal policies, such as privatization, cuts in welfare, and so on or they seek for economic recovery through alternative waves, for instance, through Keynesianism. Moreover, the support of withdrawal of Greece from the European Union and the Eurozone has particular importance in Communist Party and antagonistic logic. Last but not least, Greek capitalists and ship owners are included in the camp of the enemy, since the survival of the political regime is considered vital for their profits. On the second level, the enemy is identified as the transnational organizations. In our case, European Union, which supports bailout packets and austerity measures all over the Europe, and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which in cooperation with the European Union enforces imperialism and wage war by economic, political, and military means. According to the Communist Party, both European Union, NATO, and Greek political parties act with the intention of supporting and conserving capitalism and imperialism globally. Lastly, the main goal of Communist Party antagonistic logic is not just to deal with economic crisis and to reform capitalism, but to conquer the state and to construct a social regime in Greece. The people in party discourse is a certain element of this logic. Uh, through, through Dimitris Kutsubas, the people must, starting from the European election, must put forward a struggle for people's power for a socialist Europe. To achieve this goal, the Communist Party articulates popular democratic interpolation in strictly Marxist-Leninist terms. 
This differ differ differentiates the communist, from a, uh, communist Party from a populist party. Uh, after all, the mere presence of the people in a given discourse doesn't really render it automatically a populist one. The Marxist-Leninist discourse of the Communist Party doesn't close the Greek society as a whole, but includes only parts of it. Security forces, army and police, Greek ship owners and capitalists in general, are excluded from the people because they are considered to be part of the capitalist alliances, alliance and the, the, capital, the capitalist state. In this sense, uh, calls upon the people that the Communist Party puts forth uh, do not fulfill the criterion of univers universality in Laclos terms. The people is not, is not just an empty signifier, is not conceptualized as a quasi-universal subject, but is rather recognized in cluster and uh, analysis terms as fragment and hierarchical, hierarchical structure opposed to the enemy, to an enemy that is also clearly recognized in class terms. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um.